I'm here at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon. Today is the second day in our novena to Blessed Karl of Austria in the year of our Lord, 2023. We began yesterday with a reflection on uh, the, um, the reign of uh, Emperor Francis Joseph and the date of November 21st, 1916, when he died. He had reigned for 68 years. He had begun his reign in a time of turmoil, and he left it in a worse, in a worse time of, of turmoil, in the midst of the First World War. Well, let us look again at the situation of the First World War. And I'm reading here from the book 1917, Red Banners, White Mantle, by Warren Carroll. It's a thin little book, but uh, quite packed with a wonderful reflection upon that time and upon the Austrian Empire, the Russian Empire, uh, this, um, Pope Benedict XV, and Our Lady of Fatima. Well, let us continue then with the second chapter, War Upon the World, 1914 to 1916. And I'll skip around a little bit here. For 28 terrible months, the guns had thundered, unavailing. Europe, the fountainhead of Western civilization, the capital of the world, ran red with blood. The bare casualty statistics alone touched the unimaginable. In the first three weeks of the war, more than a million men. In the year 1915, more than four million. In 1916, two and a quarter million on the Western Front alone. These gigantic losses were not suffered in a struggle for some overriding moral or religious principle or right that might not be sacrificed at any cost. Except for one small country, Belgium, the war did not involve any nation's essential freedom or existence. It was a war of fronts in border regions, a war of trenches and attrition, a war that pitted the deadly machine gun against unprotected human flesh. A million men bled or died during 10 months before Verdun from February to October 1916. When the, ghastly grasp, when the ghastly grapple ended, both French and Germans held exactly the same positions they had held when it started. On the Somme, in the summer of 1916, over 600,000 British and French soldiers were killed or wounded to gain just eight miles, and 650,000 Germans were killed or wounded to limit them to that. Those eight miles cost the life or health of 30 men for every foot, two and a half men for every inch. On a single day at the Somme, July 1st, 1916, the British Army lost 60,000 men, one-third of them killed, the largest single day's loss of men in the thousand-year history of the British Army. It had begun at Sarajevo, and where it would end, no man could guess. Only scattered, unheeded voices spoke for peace. Pope Benedict XV, the little fellow, frail, intense, supremely dedicated, pleading and praying from Rome for an end to the orgy of killing that was destroying much of what remained of Christendom, but almost totally ignored by Catholic as well as by Protestant nations, and Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, offering a mediation that nobody wanted, which was too distantly based to do any real good, and a handful of Marxist revolutionaries who saw that the war would destroy much of the moral and material fabric of the Christian civilization that presented the most fundamental obstacle to their seizure of power and were jockeying for position to pick up the pieces. Nationalist passions had risen to absurd, almost incredible heights. Englishmen, Frenchmen, and Russians with German names were often in actual physical danger. 
On both sides, with a demented tenacity, virtually every significant national leader continued to demand total victory, whatever the price. Even though no victories of real significance had been won by either side since the first month of the war, that fateful August of 1914. Each side then had been sure it could win. By the end of 1915, if not by the end of 1914, it should have been obvious to every statesman and general in Europe that no man or nation could win this war and that the whole of Western civilization was losing it. The extension of the war through 1916 and then on through 1917 and most of 1918 was an act of mad folly unsurpassed and scarcely paralleled in the whole history of mankind in magnitude and shattering consequences. Yet, not a single statesman or general in any of the warring powers spoke out for any peace short of victory for his side. And all allies had to be satisfied. Any one of them could block peace. And by the perverted moral code of the alliances, their veto must be respected. The very word, peace, was all but forgotten, all but forbidden. To speak it, even to think it, was defeatism and close to treason. And we'll skip ahead a little bit here. Now for Imperial Austria and Imperial Russia, the situation by November 1916 was not only increasingly perilous and eventually intolerable, it was already on the brink of total and final disaster. Neither state was as strong or as wealthy as Great Britain, France, or Germany. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was a collection of some 20 nationalities and tongues, with a great and ancient heritage of unity through the persons of the Habsburg rulers, but increasingly divided as modern nationalistic agitation worked on its diverse peoples. Emperor Francis Joseph, for all his devoted and ceaseless efforts, had not been able to maintain the fullness of supervision and control at 84 and 85 and 86 that a younger man could have provided, and he had, as ever, very little help. Russian manpower outnumbered Austrian by three to one. And beside, between their support services, their national economies, and their generalship, there was little to choose. Numbers alone would have beaten Austria had Germany not been her ally. And even with German help, necessarily limited because of Germany's enormous commitment on the Western Front, the stress was steadily wearing Austria down toward the point where the delicate intertwining structure of the multinational empire would suddenly unravel into all its 20-odd components. Now, the emperor was a symbol of unity. Only in the emperor, in the House of Habsburg, was there hope for the continuity of the Austro-Hungarian regime. And young Charles now incarnated that hope and bore it well. In Russia also the Tsar was the symbol of unity, not only of the diverse people of his vast land, but of the Russian people themselves. But he was more than a symbol, like Louis XIV and unlike Charles. The Tsar was the state. There was a considerable degree of local self-government in the Austrian Empire, and virtually none at all in the Russian Empire. The Tsar was truly, as his title declared, autocrat of all the Russians, and so it had been at least since Ivan the Terrible, if not since, Char if not since Genghis Khan. But there was this fundamental difference between the regime of Tsar Nicholas II and that of his grim predecessors, Genghis Khan, was no Christian, and Ivan the Terrible, a very bad one. Although two later famous rulers of Russia were also very indifferent Christians, Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, all the czars since the beginning of the 19th century, beginning with Alexander I, who defeated Napoleon, had been profoundly religious men 
reflecting the deep faith of Holy Mother Russia and the simplest of its people. In a crisis of the magnitude of this colossal war, Russia and Austria had spiritual resources upon which to draw, which even if only in enhancing their endurance, should have made up for the relative lack of visible human and material resources, and eventually impelled them more and more toward the peace of which the warring peoples dreamed but dared not speak. In Austria, under Charles, this is precisely what happened. And we will stop there for today, the second day of the Novena. Let us turn now to our Novena prayer. And you can find a link to print this Novena prayer out in the description beneath the video. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Heavenly Father, through Blessed Emperor Karl, you have given your Church and the people of God an example of how we can live a discerning and spiritual life in a convincing and courageous way. His public actions as Emperor and King and his personal acts as a family man were firmly based in the teachings of the Catholic faith. His love for his Eucharistic Lord grew in times of trial and helped him to unite himself to Christ's sacrifice through his own life's sacrifice for his people's. Emperor Karl honored the Mother of God and loved to pray the Rosary throughout his life. Strengthen us by his intercession when discouragement, faint-heartedness, loneliness, bitterness, and depression trouble us. Let us follow the example of your faithful servant and unselfishly serve our brothers and sisters according to your will. Hear my petitions and grant my request. Let us call to mind our intentions for this novena. Let us pray especially for peace in the Holy Land, peace in our own nation. And for all the intentions of those praying this novena, grant that blessed Karl of Austria be deemed worthy of canonization for the glory of your name, the praise of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and for blessings upon the Church. Amen. Day 2. My Lord and God, according to the marvelous example of your servant Emperor Karl, I too wish to consecrate myself to your most sacred heart. Hear my petitions and grant my request through the intercession of blessed Emperor Karl of Austria. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God, our Father, through the gift of the blessed Emperor Karl, you have given us an example to follow. In extremely difficult times, he performed his burdensome tasks without ever losing his faith. He always followed your Son, the true King. He led a humble life, sincerely loving the poor and giving himself heart and soul to the search for peace. Even when his life was in danger, he trusted in you, putting his life in your hands. Almighty and merciful God, by the intercession of blessed Emperor Karl, we pray that you may give us his unconditional faith to support us in our most difficult situations and the courage to always follow the example of your only Son. Open our hearts to the poor and strengthen our commitment for peace within our families and among all peoples. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Join me tomorrow for day three in our Novena to Blessed Karl, the Emperor of Peace. And don't miss a day of prayer with us.